singing tonight. It's good to see all of you in God's house on this Wednesday evening. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me please to Romans chapter 12. Uh, Romans chapter 12 and uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 17. While you're turning to that passage of scripture, just want to say that tonight will be the final message in this little mini-series that we've of three messages that we started a couple of weeks ago on the, what is the ideal church. And uh, we talked about God's design for the church the first night and last week our responsibility in the church. And then tonight we're going to look at some scripture here that's going to help us to understand uh, what the church or what the world should expect from the church. What the world should expect from the ideal church. And I love Romans. Uh, uh, the book of Romans is one of the most uh, practical books in all the Pauline epistles as far as uh, living the Christian life. But this particular chapter, the 12th chapter, is really a really good chapter. I love it very, very much. Uh, Romans chapter 12, I hope you have your place now, verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible... As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil of good. Uh, overcome evil with good, I'm sorry. Father, thank you for the word of God tonight. We ask you to add your blessing to its reading and to its preaching tonight. Speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 
So here in these, um, in these 21 verses of the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, uh, these, all these verses deal with our behavior. Talking about our behavior as a child of God. In uh, verses 1 to 8, if you are taking notes, verses 1 to 8 deals with our behavior towards our Christian life and our service to the Lord. Verses 9 to 16 uh, deals with our behavior towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, the brethren. And then these last five verses, verses 17 to 21, deals with our behavior towards the world of the lost persons. And uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, is what does the world at large expect or should expect from the ideal church. Now, as we look at these verses tonight, I'm reminded, I'm reminded through this study that the church is not a building. You know that. The church is a people. It's a congregation. It's a family of born-again baptized believers who have voluntarily joined together under the leadership of the Holy Spirit for the express purpose of fulfilling the great commission as given to us by our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's, a, there's your quick little definition of what a church is and what our, what our purpose is. But let me remind us of the first night our text was 1 Timothy 3.15 But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And so what we're going to see tonight is not how we're supposed to behave ourselves in the building, but how we're supposed to behave ourselves in this house, uh, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, we talk about our great commission, and that, that's, what, that's what our task is as a church, is to fulfill this great commission. And uh, Jesus gave it to us in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now I heard a preacher one time break that, those two verses down into a little outline like this. He said that, the Great Commission is we're supposed to win them, wet them, and work them. And that's kind of cute, I guess, and it's sort of a crude way of putting it. But uh, basically, that's what we are supposed to do. Now, just real quick, let's look at our Great Commission that we may understand what it is we're supposed to do, and that's going to feed us into the remainder of the message tonight. We see, first of all, uh, we see that uh, uh, the Bible tells us to go ye. Go ye. That's the first two words in Matthew 28, 19. And the ye in verse 19, that's us. That's the believers. That's the church. We are the ones that are supposed to go. And then the largest part of the remainder of these two verses deals with our mission. Uh, as we come down into that text of Scripture, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach. We're supposed to teach. That's... That's soul winning. We're supposed to teach them how to be saved. And then it says that we're to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. And so when we bring new converts in, we are to follow the Lord's commandment and the ordinance of baptism and baptize those new converts in believer's baptism by immersion. And then he says, he goes on and then he says, teaching them to observe all things. That's discipleship. So we see our three main roles in the Great Commission. We are to evangelize the lost, we're to win souls, we're to baptize the new converts, and then we're to disciple them. We're to teach them. We're to teach them the Bible and ground, get them grounded in the Word of God for the purpose of them going out and uh, winning other people to Christ. And then the last part of our Great Commission is uh, the Lord defines our mission field. And in these two verses in Romans, uh, I mean, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he defines our mission field in two words, all nations. That's our mission field. We're to go to all nations. And 
This is the world of the lost people. And uh, they, 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 have, they, they have the right to expect some things from the church because it is they that we're trying to win and uh, to bring them to Christ to be saved by His marvelous grace. I want to make a statement here. The most effective churches operating in the world today who are trying to fulfill the Great Commission are not necessarily large churches. It's not the size of the church that matters, but rather what sort of church it is. The measure of the ideal church is its likeness to Christ. And that's what makes a great church. Now, I'm I'm reminded as we look at these five verses here tonight, (laughs) I am reminded of the words of our Lord Jesus In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43, you've heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect. Means Here that means spiritually mature. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So if you're writing things down, I'm going to give this to you kind of quick, and if you don't get it all wrote down, I'll give it to you later on. But what the world should expect from the ideal church is very simple. A clear presentation of the gospel from the lips of people who live out daily in reality what they say they believe. That's what the world should expect from the church. Now the Word of God, written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul here in Romans chapter 12 and verses 17 through 21 are going to back up that statement that I just made in these five verses. Now as all of the rest of Romans chapter 12, these five verses deal with our behaviors Uh, in relation, as a church body, in relation to the lost world that we'll encounter on a daily basis. And may I say, and, and I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, prayer and perseverance will be required. So the message is clear. Now let's examine our methods. And this talks about our behavior Uh, our behavior as we're trying to fulfill that that great commission I read to you and uh, uh, giving uh, that clear presentation of the gospel uh, should be from our lips, not as hypocrites, but as those who live out what we say we believe. First of all, the world should expect from the church that we would be honest in all of our actions. The world needs to see honesty in the church uh, uh, because there's so many. I mean, you, everywhere we turn, we're lied to. We're lied to most every day and just about all day if you uh, have the time to turn a television onto a news channel. Somebody is lying to you. You can't believe hardly anything. Anybody says, well, when it comes to fulfilling the great commission of getting the gospel, a clear presentation of the gospel to lost people. Uh, They're not going to hear one word we say until they hear and see that we are real. That we are who we say we are and that we're not trying to impress somebody with our Bible knowledge, but that we are real, true blue, concerned about their soul. Verse 17 says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. But I want you to know that as we do that, we're going to run into obstacles. And we're going to run into people who do not want to hear our message. 
And we're going to run into people who are going to hate you and hate me. And Jesus said, they hated me, they'll hate you. And, and, and I know it's difficult sometimes to control that flesh. It really is. I have difficulty controlling that flesh from time to time. But the Bible tells us here to recompense uh, no man, to no man evil for evil. So not only should we be honest in all of our actions, but we should uh, resolve to never lower ourself and get in a debate uh, with a lost person and cause us to lose our character and our testimony. Uh, as a child of God, I believe that's what Paul is telling us here, to recompense to no man evil for evil. Remember, offenses will come, but God is in control. And God fights our battles for us. And uh, remember uh, the, the three parts of our great commission. And the Lord's going to have to go with us to fulfill that because we're going to face a lot of obstacles. But may we practice to be honest in all our actions and never lower ourselves to other people's actions. Don't let other people's sins and actions dictate what ours will be is what I'm trying to say. Verse number 18, Paul says, If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably, with all men. So the second thing I want to bring to your attention tonight that the world should expect from the church is that we be a peaceful in our attitude, a not a contentious, a not trying to uh, pick a fight or not trying to put somebody down because they don't believe the way that we do or they don't believe at all. The Bible tells us that he says that as much, as much as life in you, he says, be at peace with all men if it be possible. You know, we're in the business, or I should say, we're not in the business of trying to drag people we have defeated down the aisle. We're trying to lead poor sinners to Christ. And they're going to have to see Christ in us before they're going to be willing to accept Christ for themselves. Remember, they're not going to come to Christ because of what they hear us say. They will come to Christ when they see what we do. He tells us we're to give 100% to this, uh, to accomplish this. We must be peaceful in our attitude. He said, as much as life in you, and he said, if we do that, we'll be following the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So Paul is telling us here that we must be honest in our actions. We must never lower ourselves to the actions of, of other men. And as, as, if it be possible, give it all you got as much as lie in you. Try to live a peaceable life with all men and we will be blessed of God uh, as a peacemaker. Verse 19. I know I'm moving kind of, kind of quickly through this here, but I want to I get it done tonight. Because uh, we got our Wednesday night service, uh, uh, revival service to start next Wednesday night. So in verse number 19, I want you to look at that. Paul says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So here again, Paul is dealing with us in our behavior with the lost world and what the world should expect from us. Uh, he's talking about uh, offenses coming against us again. People coming against us, people doing us wrong while we're out trying to do the Lord's work. And here's the third thing that he wants us to remember from verse 19 is we must never seek vengeance against any man. I know, I know it's difficult sometimes to not do that. People can be so mean and so ugly and our human nature is to lash right back out at them. But Paul says to not do that. He says, give, uh, avenge not yourselves, 
but rather give place unto wrath. Now there's three reasons I want to give you quickly. Number one, when you're dealing with people who you want to exact some vengeance on, first of all, consider your testimony. You lose it, and it's gone. And, the, and that person probably will never believe another thing you say. And always remember that if you can't win somebody when you're talking to them, please leave them in a condition that somebody can come along behind you and win them. We can't win them all, but we can try to leave them in a condition well enough by our behavior and our compassion and our actions that somebody else can come along behind us. So when that temptation comes up, uh, consider your testimony. Secondly, consider their soul. If you stop to think that the way you're about to behave on that person or what you're about to say to that person may literally be the, the hinge that their soul is swinging on, either to heaven or to hell. Remember their soul. That's what's at stake. Not our pride. Not us getting the upper hand. Not us getting uh, even or whatever you want to call it. Consider their soul. And then thirdly, consider God's Word. Remember what God's Word said about this. He said, Beloved, don't, don't avenge yourself, but you give place to wrath. For God's Word says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. That's quoted both in the Old Testament and in the New. And so don't seek vengeance from any man. Look at verse number 20. Now this is, this is a controversial type of verse. It's got a, it's got a statement in there that um, is kind of uh, difficult to understand, but it's not if you study it and, and study it out. He says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Well, now that's not too hard to understand. It might be difficult to do, but he said that's how to treat the enemy. He's hunger, feed him. He's thirsty, give him to drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now what in the world is, that, is he talking about? Is he talking about getting even with them? No, he just told us in the verse before that we're not to exact vengeance on anybody. If you go back and study that phrase, you have to go back into the Old Testament and study out that phrase, coals of fire. It means acts of kindness. That's what it means. If he's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. And in doing so, you're showing him acts of kindness. Now these are people who are lost that don't know the Lord. And, and so we're, we're to show them acts of kindness. We are, we are to be on the offensive for kindness always. The church, the world should expect that from the church. That the church is kind as we give out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And compassionate. Did you know that by doing that, we receive rewards from the Lord? At the judgment seat, there will be rewards given for being kind, just being kind and showing acts of kindness to lost people, and especially to those who are so against us. Let me read you two verses quickly from... Proverbs chapter number 25, verse 21 and 22. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. That's Proverbs 25, 21 and 22 if you're marking your Bible. So we've looked at these four verses here. And uh, he's told us to be honest in our actions. Never lower ourselves to the actions of others. Be peaceful in our attitude. Not seek vengeance when we're wronged. 
and always be on the offensive for kindness. But I like this last verse. It's the simplest one in the whole context. He says, be, over, uh, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's a short little verse. But you know what? Don't raise your hand, but how many of you in your Christian life have let the evil overtake you? If nothing else in, in your mind, in your attitude, maybe not in your speech and maybe not in your actions, but in your attitude, you let the evil overtake you. It's happened to me. But the Bible tells us here that the church uh, it should be expected to always be on the offensive of not only kindness, but to always be on the offensive for good. We're to look for opportunities to do good one to another. The Bible tells us why we can do this. Some may say, well, we can't do that. That's just too much. Well, the Bible says we can do that. In 1 John chapter 4, in verse 4, he says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that a great vote of, or a voice of confidence for us as we try to live out our life for Christ? Is that greater is He that's in us than he that is in the world, so we should always have victory over the evil and let the good rule and reign. We should always be on the offensive for good because it, it honors God. And, and I believe we want to honor God with our life. Paul told the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 7, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord, and not to men. As doing good will, as unto the Lord. It honors God. And then lastly, in, in this thought of be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good, he tells us that we should do that because it gives God glory. And that's really what it's all about. And I'm glad that he saved that one for last. It's just a great progression in our behaviors in these five verses. And when it boils all, when everything's boiled down, and, and what we've got left is that whatsoever we do, whether we eat or whether we drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. That's what it's all about. Jesus reminded us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, as I close the message, let me just say in, in repeating, in closing, the church, the, the world should expect some things from the church should expect us to be honest in all of our actions. We should be true blue and we should never lower ourselves to the actions of others. They should see a difference in us. We are not supposed to be the same. It doesn't matter if they respect us. It doesn't matter if they like us as long as they see that there's a difference in us. That we walk different. We talk different. We act different. We have different desires. We use a different language than the world uses. The world should expect us to be in a peaceful kind of attitude when we come to them. Not trying to 
run them down or drag them to the altar and beat them over the head to make them get to be saved, but be peaceable about it and show them Christ in our life and never ever seek vengeance. God will take care of all that and always be on the offensive for kindness and on the offensive for good. Now, that's what the world should expect from us. That's an awful lot for us to live up to, isn't it? That's an awful lot for us to be able to master, but we can do it. We've got the guidebook right here of how to do that. I hope the series has been a blessing and a help to you over these past three weeks. The Lord willing, next Wednesday night, Brother Bob June will be here preaching for us. Brother Bob, I've known him a long, long time. He's a good man of God and a good preacher, and I know that you'll enjoy his preaching next Wednesday night. Let's bow our heads and be dismissed. Father, thank you for the Word of God tonight, Lord, and thank you for these messages on the church, and Lord, what an ideal church is according to the Scripture. And Lord, we, we're not sinlessly perfect, so we're going to fail and let you down, but we just pray in Jesus' name that you'll help us to remember these things and, and take them with us, dear Lord, where we go. And, and uh, Lord, may we, may we be a Christian that the world looks at and says they're real. They're real. They're different. They're not like the rest of the world. That it may bring glory and honor unto you that we may fulfill your great commission for us. Now, Lord, we ask you to dismiss the service tonight uh, with your grace and bless each one. Give them traveling grace and mercy home. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Thank you for coming to church tonight. God bless you.